you once again, and yes, for I guess the third week in a row, we're going to talk a little debt ceiling action. Uh, first of all, I uh, have to apologize just a little bit. I meant to get this presentation out to you a little earlier in the week, but we did have some technical issues. I'm having to retake this thing again, so this is the second run-through of this that, uh, that I've done. Uh, so we're getting this to you a little later than we normally do. I do apologize for that. But uh, since we're going to talk about the debt ceiling for the third week in a row, and I'll, I'll tell you right now where we're going to end up in this presentation, uh, by the end of this presentation, I am going to give you a solid three-step plan for what this country needs to do to get its financial house in order. Uh, you're you're going to get answers from me. You're going to get a plan from me the way that you are not getting it from anybody else in the media, in government, anywhere else. I will give you the plan that will work. But we'll get to that a little bit later. So let's kind of reset where we are right now. Barack Obama for a couple of weeks has told anybody that would listen, and a lot of people who won't, that this whole thing has to be avoided. That the debt ceiling must be raised, because if we don't raise the debt ceiling, my God, it's going to be horrible. Oh, it's just practically the end of the world as we know it. And Obama tries to create these scenarios that sound like something right out of the book of Revelation uh, to scare people in, into taking some action on this. Uh, trying to tell people that, well, I, I just can't guarantee that Social Security checks are going to come out, you know, and, and I, I can't guarantee benefits for the military. And some, Shucks, we just have to raise this, this debt ceiling. And, you know, if we're going to raise the debt ceiling, we have to do it in a balanced approach, which means we have to tax the hell out of the rich. It's balanced when you only tax the rich. And it's fairness when you only tax the rich. That's life in Barack Obama's world. But let's put that myth of absolute disaster if the debt ceiling is not raised. Let's put that myth, myth to rest right here and right now. What happens on August 2nd if the debt ceiling isn't raised? Well, it means we can't borrow any more money. And given the way things are going, we probably shouldn't be borrowing any more money. But nevertheless, if the debt ceiling is not raised, we will not be able to borrow any more money. Okay, what does that mean? Well, legally, by terms of the law, what must be paid by America is the service on the debt, the debt that we've already incurred. Depending on whose numbers you look at, that comes to around $29 billion. Okay, that's not a number to sneeze at. That's a very large number. But I can tell you that the money and the revenue that should be coming in next month will easily cover the $29 billion. So our debt service will be paid next month even without the debt ceiling being raised. So legally that has to happen. It will happen. Nothing to worry about there. So what about the questions about Social Security checks and benefit checks and all of this? The thing that Obama's trying to hold over everybody's head and trying to scare Granny and Grandpa with. Well, the one thing Mr. Obama is conveniently not telling you about all of this is that for those checks not to go out, for those checks to not to be cut, for him to make the determination that, okay, i, I got to cut some corners here, I don't have as much money to work with, so I have to make some decisions uh, so we won't send Social Security checks out this month. The only person that can make that decision is the president. What I'm telling you is that if, and it's not going to happen, but if Social Security checks were not to go out, if pay for our military was not to go out, if benefit checks were not to go out, the only person who could make that decision is Barack Obama himself. Now, I do not for a second think that he is stupid enough to try and do that and try and pin it on the Republicans. He, he's having that inference now. He's trying to get that across to you that it will be our fault, but really it will be his. Now, I do not think that he would be stupid enough to try to allow that to happen and then claim it's our fault. It would be political suicide, and here's why. For the last week, the Republican Party, talk radio, the conservative media, they have been all over this. They have been pointing out this possibility. We're aware of it. We're on top of it. And if Barack Obama tried to do that, if your Social Security checks, etc., did not go out, we would be right there to expose that he unilaterally made the determination that those checks would not go out. And when we thoroughly expose that for exactly what happened, 
Obama could kiss 2012 goodbye. So I'm telling you, it would be political suicide for him to try it. We would be right there. We would make sure the nation knew about it. And I'll guarantee you, he would take a loss in the 2012 election of Mondale-esque proportions. Obama doesn't have the balls to do it. Hell, I'll call your bluff on that one, Barack. If, 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 if you want people to think the Social Security checks aren't going to come out, I double-dog dare you not to send them out. I dare you not to send them out. Because if you don't send them out, all we have to do is tell the American people why they didn't go out. They didn't go out because you singularly and unilaterally decided they would not go out. Not because of us, not because of the debt ceiling, not because of anybody else. You and only you would have made that decision. All right? So I'm going the long way around telling you that that's not going to happen. You don't need to worry about it. So does that mean that all of this debt ceiling talk is for naught? That all of this is really just uh, shuffling around and posturing? No, I, I think this really is something in terms of content, in terms of a topic that we as a nation do need to discuss. I think it is healthy that we are having that debate. And I do think it is critical that we make some changes in our financial way that we do things for our future. Do I think that August 2nd is going to be financial Armageddon if we don't raise the debt ceiling? No, I don't believe that. But I do believe that financial Armageddon is on the way. It probably won't be August 2nd, but it might be a few years down the line. It might be within the next decade. So it does behoove us as a nation to take the time and take the opportunity to really take a solid look at what we're doing, really take a solid look at our spending, and take a look at what we need to do differently to avoid this. So that's where my plan comes into play. What I'm going to give you is a three-step plan for how we can avoid the financial meltdown that is sure to come at some point, not August the 2nd, but at some point down the line. It is still coming. Don't, don't get me wrong. So what do we need to do? Well, let me preface my little three-point plan by, by saying this. The plan I'm about to give you will piss off every Democrat within the sound of my voice. But the plan I'm about to give you will also piss off a good number of Republicans within the sound of my voice, too. Frankly, if you live anywhere near the city of Washington, D.C., you're probably going to hurl at the thought of what I'm about to say. But I believe it needs to be said. I believe it's critical. And I believe, frankly, it's the only way that our nation can avoid the impending mess. So here it is. Step number one. We as a nation must recognize and admit our mistakes during the 20th century. Now, what do I mean by that? When I say our mistakes during the 20th century, what does that mean? Well, what I'm talking about is the fact that during the 20th century, we had a political philosophy take hold in this country that was based largely on what I like to call advocacy government. It was based on the idea that government, if structured correctly, if uh, funded correctly, if executed correctly, could solve most of society's problems that it could be a key factor in bettering people's lives. That if we just fund it the right way, if we just structure it the right way, if we just put the right people in charge of it, government can cure the ills of humanity. You know, we went from, uh, previous to the 20th century, we went from a situation where the government was essentially set up to take care of very specific and very enumerated things and not to, to leave that box, to a situation where we thought, well, Government needs to right the wrongs of the world. Now, make no mistake about it. Through the 20th century, the Democrats were right out in front of that. They were the ones driving the bus on that. But the Republicans were no angels either during the 20th century. They, they took as much of that as they could too. When you think about Richard Nixon and his price controls and George W. Bush and compassionate conservatism. Let's face it, the Republicans have a lot of cul culpability in this too. So what was the result? The result was a government that we spent more money on than we ever had before, that we borrowed money to fund, and a government that in all of its attempts to cure all of the ills of human society and of the human condition, frankly, failed. Think about all of those wars on poverty that we had, and all the money we've spent on that, and all the redistribution of income we've done. Did it help? No, poverty's still there just as much as it ever has been. 
And think about this. Think about those vaunted entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, you know, those things that even the Republicans are scared to touch. Think about those for a second. If you go back to uh, one of the presentations I did a few weeks back on embracing the third rail, I told you at the time that entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, that depending on whose numbers you look at, those constitute somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of our overall budget in any given year. Now, you'll also remember that I told you that those percentages and that amount of the budget is not something that Congress gets together every year or every couple of years and says, okay, we have X amount of money, let's pencil in X percent for Social Security and X percent for Medicare and X percent for Medicaid. No, that's not what happens. What actually happens is that legislated into those programs and they were passed was a formula that determines how much money will be spent on those entitlement programs. A formula that's based out of population, demographics, and some other factors like that. So in other words, nobody in Congress actually uh, pencils in how much it we're going to spend on any of those things. It's all dictated by a formula. A formula that does not take into account what our economy is doing. A formula that does not take into account our GDP or or you know, how anybody's doing, or how the economy as a whole is doing, or what our future looks like, none of that. It's literally a formula based on population and demographics. If those numbers go up, then we're paying more for those programs come hell or high water. Essentially, entitlement programs are like the adjustable rate mortgage on our society. You just don't know what you're gonna pay from year to year. Well, that's the issue. That's the biggest part of the issue right there. We have to look at that. We have to change that. In my estimation, we have to phase those programs out. Now, don't get me wrong. I would say, and I think every Republican would agree with me at this point, that the current seniors that are out there now, the next generation of seniors, yes, we need to fulfill our commitment to those people. They have had no choice but to pay into this godforsaken system, so they should get the benefits, such as they are, that they have been forced to pay into. I agree with that. So when a Democrat tells you that uh, you know, a Republican wants to, to throw grandma off the cliff. That's absolute bullshit. Every Republican I've, I've heard has said, hey, let's take care of the people who are in the system now. But what I'm telling you is that for the future generations, for my generation, we need to get rid of this thing. It's not going to work. In fact, I hear some Republicans try to make the case that, well, you know, we need to make changes to Social Security so it can be around for my, my son and daughter's generation. No, 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 no. This program and these programs are so broken that there's nothing you can do with the math to make them feasible going forward. It simply cannot work. We're better off finding an intelligent way to phase them out for future generations, including mine, than we are trying to spend more good money after bad, trying to fix something that is broken beyond the point that it can be fixed. The entire reason that we have entitlement programs your Social Securities and Medicares, etc. The entire reason we have those programs is because somewhere along the line, we as a nation decided that we wanted government to play a role in, in taking care of poverty or taking care of people or taking care of people in their later years or, or being effectively insurance for people or a safety net. It did not work. The same issues exist that existed before we're just broke. That's the only difference. So we have to make that hard determination. So we have to recognize our faults during the 20th century, our bad decisions, which included an advocacy government, which, which included thinking that government is there to do more than just a few basic things. The idea that government is there to directly impact the future. It is not. Second thing we need to do, once we have admitted and recognized our mistakes, the second step we must take is to rethink and redefine what we believe government should be. You know, if we're going to uh, make the realization and make the determination that we made some mistakes in the 20th century in, in promoting and, and funding this advocacy government, we need to make the determination and rethink what government now should be. Now, what does that mean? Well, I think most of us would agree that a government should do some very basic things. We need a government to protect our national security. We need a government to you know, provide police protection, protect our property, protect our lives, uh, enforce property rights, 
enforce, you know, have a judicial system. Uh, we need a government to enforce, you know, copyrights and things like that. Nobody's going to argue with that, and I'm certainly not going to argue with it. But we really do not need a government to do much more beyond those things. So we need to, once we've recognized our mistakes in the 20th century, we then need to have that solid redefinition of what government is. Protect our lives, protect our national security, protect our property rights, enforce the law, and that's about it. We don't need the government overseeing everything. We don't need the government... Uh, government bureaus and government agencies regulating every single little business and every single little industry and putting all sorts of environmental regulations out there that really don't amount to a hill of beans. We don't need any of that. Let's cut government back to the basics and redefine those basic things we want government to do. And then third and finally, this is going to be the toughest, this third step, this is going to be the toughest step of all. This is the one that's going to piss more people off than any of the other ones. And this is going to be the one that we can't implement overnight, we can't implement it in a month, probably can't implement it in a year. This is going to take years to do. The third and final and most important step of all of this is to take that definition of government that we just made in step two and put every government expenditure, every government program, every government agency under the microscope. And when we put these agencies and these programs and these expenditures under the microscope, we have to ask the question, does this expenditure fulfill the basic needs that we need government to provide? And if that answer is no, then you either drastically cut it or you get rid of it. And that goes for everything. We have to put everything under the microscope. We have to ask, do we really need the government to have a Department of Education? Do we really need public education? Do we need a National Weather Service? And on and on and on and on. Go through every single thing the government does. And government's grown so big that you won't be able to do that overnight. You've got to do it over a long period of time. But it has to be done. So there's your three steps. Admit and recognize our mistakes from the 20th century. Rethink and redefine government. And once you've done that, put every government expenditure program and, and agency under the microscope and cut absolutely everything that is not in that new basic definition of what government should do. There it is. And for my money, that's the only way we're going to get through this. I mean, think about it. Most of us, myself included, have been in situations where we run into some financial problems. You know, you lose a job, you have some some medical crisis come up, sudden change in your life, divorce, something like that. And we've all been in those positions where we, we figure out, you know, we, got, we have to cut some spending. If we're going to survive, we've got to cut some spending. And when you go through that, the, at first you think, you think you can do it with, with just some real easy cuts. Well, you know, maybe I'll eat out a little bit less. Or, oh, uh, well, maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll uh, you know, drop down to a lesser cable TV package or something. And you think you've done some big work, but then you look at your bills a month later and you realize, I really didn't put a dent in that at all. And that's the point where you have to make the real cuts. That's the point where you have to say, you know what? Maybe I don't need cable TV at all. Maybe I don't need internet access. Maybe I don't need a second car. Maybe I can shop at the thrift store for clothes. That's where you really make the cuts that are going to have significant effect on your life. That's the point the United States is at right now. For 75 or 100 years, we have funded and borrowed money to fund a government that has tried to do too much. And as we've talked about before, that government that tried to do too much really didn't accomplish much of anything other than bankrupting us. So whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you have to realize that that style of government cannot be sustained going forward. Quite frankly, America is in a similar position to Amy Winehouse, believe it or not. We are a nation who, much like Amy Winehouse, had a ton of talent, had a ton of potential, and had a pretty good run for a brief period of time. But like Amy Winehouse, we've become addicted to poison. The poison that we have become addicted to is government and spending. 
Well, much like Amy Winehouse, we have the opportunity right now to go through detox, to detoxify ourselves from government, to, to kick the habit of government and spending. And detox is not a pleasant thing. It's not an easy thing. But it's a necessary thing if you're going to stay alive. Or we can reject this idea. We can turn our back on going to detox. We can be offered the chance to go to rehab. We can be confronted with that. And like Amy Winehouse, we can say, no, no, no. And if America does that, then a global, in a global perspective, we will meet the same fate as Amy Winehouse. Our addiction will kill us. That's where we're at. Now, I know that's not a pleasant set of circumstances to talk about. And I know a lot of you out there are saying, hey, that, that's going to be a very unpopular thing. You're never going to be able to sell that to the American people. You know what? You might be right. But I think that this is a moment in our history where the American character is being tested. And how we respond right now will determine if our nation not only will prosper, but if our nation will survive the next century. Is America going to live or die? That's a question. Because if we do not cut government, notice I didn't just say cut spending, if we do not cut government and get a better definition of what government is supposed to be and cut everything that doesn't fit that definition, then it's been a great run, but America will cease to exist. That's what everything comes down to. And whether that's popular or not, the question is whether enough of the American people are smart enough, smart enough to recognize it and to take action on it, and man enough to take action on it. I hate to end on a down note, but that's where we are. The decision's in our hands. Are we man enough to go through the detox that we have to go through? Or are we going to wallow in this addiction and eventually perish? The answer to that question is up to us, folks. That's where we stand. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.